So, welcome everyone to the sixth intergenerational dialogue of the DEC project. Today, our guest speaker is Dr. Tatiana Triadidou, program manager at the ITML. And uh, today we will discuss about the AI technologies that have emerged, such as the chat GPT, the potential they unlock and possibly challenges that they pose. So, uh, Tatiana, thank you for being here today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alkinos, for the invitation and the introduction. Um, okay, I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, the company I work for uh, and also part the company that participates in the action. It's uh, ITML, it's uh, Informatics SME located in Athens. Uh, we also have uh, offices in, in Cyprus and we are approximately 59 people. 70% uh, of which are engaged in uh, uh, research and development activities. Uh, the main um, uh, focus of the, the the main focus of the company is, uh, I would say, uh, in, lies in four pillars. It's the security, um, cybersecurity. So there are products there for security, incident, event management. Uh, we're also very active in data analytics, and we also have a service there that offers business insights, exploiting data streams, uh, a very, a very uh, big volumes of data streams uh, in uh, real time. Uh, we also offer uh, cyber uh, customer experience and user experience um, services. And uh, there is a lot of uh, um, activities uh, research-wise. So at the moment, uh, we have 27 uh, projects running, uh, research projects funded by the European Union and other uh, national and international um, funds. Uh, and we have successfully completed so far since the company was founded 29 projects. A little bit about myself, just to get to know each other. Um, as Alkinos mentioned, uh, I, I work as a program manager in ITML since 2018. My main role is to uh, overview all the research programs um, that are running in, in the company. Uh, spanning across different application areas. One of them is uh, artificial intelligence. So we are quite active in the field of machine learning. Uh, I've worked for over seven years in uh, top research institutes, mainly in the UK where I, I studied. Uh, I've also worked as a scientific consultant for, um, for projects, um, mostly focusing on uh, biomedical engineering and life sciences. Uh, and I'm also a chartered electrical and electronic engineer since 2009. As I mentioned before, I have a PhD in bioelectronics. So my main focus is um, uh, electronics in the health sector. Uh, and uh, that since 2012, um, I also have, uh, let's say, as an extra curriculum activity, uh, I serve as a peer reviewer for scientific journals and an editorial board member in Nature Scientific Reports. So coming back to today's presentation, um, first of all, I would like to give an introduction about what is artificial intelligence. And if you look for a definition, um, the most common definition of artificial intelligence is the simulation of human intelligence processes by machines. So basically, artificial intelligence is a software, a software application that understands and responds to human language, both written and oral. It can learn and improve over time without additional intervention, so with and without human in the loop, as we call it, and it can process a vast amount of, da of data quickly and efficiently. However, you, you might uh, find that there are several constraints on how uh, artificial intelligence should be defined, because if we take into account some factors like, uh, for example, Artificial intelligence is similar to human intelligence, but in what aspects? We consider that human intelligence is the most prestigious intelligence so far. Also, there is a constraint uh, related to a difference between human and artificial intelligence in other aspects, such as, for example, the goal is to build an intelligent computer, not an artificial person. So we don't aim to substitute humans, we aim to complement humans through artificial intelligence systems. Also, another aspect 
uh, to consider is that human intelligence should not be perceived as the only form of intelligence. Otherwise, AI research would be obsolete if, uh, if we don't need to further improve uh, any kind of intelligence other than the human intelligence. And last, if we consider that existing computer systems intelligence should not be assumed, so AI research would be unnecessary uh, in that part, meaning that um, we continuously we would like to continuously evolve uh, computer systems um, and evolve their artificial intelligence. Uh, so we reach a point where it can serve the human, but also it can improve uh, humans. So how does artificial intelligence work? It uses algorithms, which is a set of rules uh, to be followed in several calculations or other problem solving operations. Algorithms are fed with data, a vast amount of data normally, and they try to extrapolate patterns they come across and find correlations. It can use any kind of data like text, it can use sound, images, or even video. Some the subdomains of artificial intelligence are the one listed in that slide. We're not going to to go through these in detail because they become uh, more or less technical. But in a nutshell, um, when we talk about artificial intelligence, one category is the machine learning, which is most commonly um, come across. It's decision making based on past experiences. So the system is fed with an initial set of data and it's trained. It, it, it learns from these training data sets to extrapolate patterns. And then um, when, it, when it is fed with a new data set, based on the correlations that it previously extrapolated, it can uh, find new correlations on the, on the new data set. Uh, there is also the category of deep learning, which is decision-making based on unstructured or unmarked data. This kind of um, uh, AI uh, works in the same correlations, it does the same correlations uh, similar to the human mind. Neural networks, they recognize relationships in data sets similarly to how neural cells work. Natural language processing, this is mostly used in, uh, for example, uh, virtual assistants uh, like Alexa or Siri. Um, they can read, they can understand, they can listen, and they can interpret a language uh, easily. Computer vision is another category, uh, meaning that uh, the system can understand an image by decomposing it in uh, distinct parts and studies multiple parts. So uh, divides the, the image or the, a video, even a, a video in different parts, analyzes each part and then combines all together uh, individual results. And then we have cognitive computing. Uh, basically, it deals with uh, analyzing text, speech, objects and images similarly to the human brain. Some applications of AI, um, it's quite uh, qu quite popular in medical applications. So there is um, a lot of research on building uh, me medical assistance, medical AI assistance for uh, assisting diagnosis. Uh, also, there are robots uh, in operation. So it's the very popular Da Vinci surgical system where they do laparoscopic procedures using computer on uh, using the, the, the robot only. In the automotive sector, uh, there is a lot of rising research on autonomous cars, trying to um, build a smart car that has a lot of sensors, that has a lot of um, incoming data from the surrounding environment but also from the driver so inside the cabin and trying to determine um, what's going on and move autonomously uh, there are also robots in the assembly production lines and this is already a fact in big uh, manufacturing sites like uh, audis or fiat's uh, um, uh, manufacturing sites also in the e-commerce section there are recommendation engines um, they learn they listen to our preferences, to user preferences, so they can uh, they can use personalized recommendations for buying products. Um, so it's targeted advertisement. Uh, there are also chatbots. Uh, for example, um, uh, ChatGPT is one of uh, one popular chatbot. 
Uh, and also in e-commerce, there are AI systems that uh, have been built to predict demand so that they manage stocks. Also in disaster response, there are search and rescue robots that are becoming um, uh, quite developed uh, lately. Uh, they have uh, capabilities such as image recognition and sound analysis. And in harsh and dangerous outdoor environments, they are sent to um, provide a, a very thorough mapping uh, of, of what is there, of the environment, of any people are, that are in need of help. So in disaster response, this, uh, the AI systems are becoming uh, very popular as well. These are some concrete examples uh, of uh, artificial intelligence systems. As I mentioned before, digital assistants like Alexa or Siri, uh, they are using natural language processing to understand our speech. Um, and they perform uh, personalized recommendations and answer to questions. Uh, facial, de facial detection and recognition, for example, using our phones. This is also one form of uh, AI. Text editors and autocorrection, uh, which we come across almost every day, is another form, another example of AI. Maps and navigations, for example, Google Maps, where they um, they map the, the the route based on the destination and the the origin, and they also give predictions about traffic patterns. Uh, in red, there is heavy traffic. In yellow, it's medium traffic and so on. So this is also an example of AI. Personalized search and recommendation. For example, if you search for a specific product, um, even using Google search, then, for example, in Facebook, you might find some sponsored but personalized recommendations of products uh, that you have previously searched for. And this is, for example, a screenshot that I was looking for uh, for a, a chair for my for my child. And then suddenly in Facebook, I found this personalized uh, advertisement about uh, uh, high chairs for, for children. And then there is chatbots, as we mentioned before, and we're going to uh, look into chat GPT in detail uh, later on in this presentation. So the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, AI. Let's start with the advantages. Uh, so one of the biggest strength, uh, one of the biggest strengths of the AI systems is that they can deal with time consuming tasks. They can uh, process large amount of data um, almost in real time. So this gives more free time for humans to deal with high level tasks. Uh, they can extrapolate meaningful patterns uh, that promote understanding. So think about having huge amounts of data that the human eye could never find a correlation. Uh, this is something that can be done within a blink of the eye. Um, and this has several applications, like in medical diagnosis, in climate crisis. So AI systems have been used so far to process large amounts of weather data, of environmental data, and they can give predictions about the climate crisis, what comes next in the next few years even. The disadvantages of AI systems. Uh, well, a lot of people are worried that um, AI systems will eventually substitute many jobs. So that means that unemployment rates will increase. Um, there is also a concern about the advanced infrastructure that this system needs. So they need, um, for example, um, very strong servers, uh, a lot of memory, a lot of um, uh, processing power because of the complexity of these uh, systems. Also, one of the limitations of AI is uh, considered to be bias. For example, uh, if if the AI system is trained with a data set that is already biased, the outcome is most likely to be a biased outcome. Um, they often lack creativity, so the, the output is more or less um, predicted. Um, and sometimes, the, uh, due to the limitations of the AI, because an AI system is as good as its trained data set, as the data set that it, it is trained to um, to extract uh, correlations, it may lead to false outcomes on which humans rely on it. So there is a big concern here about should we rely on the outcome that the AI, AI system gives us? And I will give a, an example targeted to the medical sector later on. And another big concern 
that there is a lot of research lately is the um, is the ethics that is involved when using AI systems. And this deals with, for example, um, ethical implementation could be uh, could also touch the legal aspect. So the outcome of the AI, who is accountable for that? Uh, in legal terms, in ethical terms. And this is a big concern that accompanies um, AI research lately. So let's uh, see uh, close to a case study now uh, targeted on the medical sector. This is from, um, from a research that was conducted by the Google uh, research, by Google research team, the Google brain research team. Uh, so they... Uh, they conducted a study um, involving 21 pathologists uh, using deep neural network, a deep neural network uh, AI system. And the main purpose of the study was to investigate the key types of information that medical experts desire when they are first introduced to diagnostic um, AI assistant. So the problem there was um, uh, to use an AI assistant to help with the prognosis of prostate cancer. Um, and there were a lot of concerns generally within the medical um, sector. So doctors, they don't trust AI because they're not sure about uh, how it works, what kind of uh, results it will generate. So that was a very thorough study about that. And the outcome was... Um, actually quite interesting because if we would like to list the five things that doctors need to know before working with an AI assistant, it would be first of all to identify the capabilities and limitations. So the doctors would like to know the overall performance of the artificial intelligence system in terms of how accurate it is, how precise it is, the functionality, so what kind of information it access and how it is used by artificial intelligence. So the problem here is that most of the medical experts, they treat AI system as a black box. They don't know how it works. They don't know what input it takes, what output it takes, what process it follows. They don't know the medical point of view. So if they, if we would like to treat the AI system as a colleague, as a, as a doctor, as a fellow doctor, uh, we would like to know what is their medical point of view in terms of cancer severity? So if they're more liberal in their diagnosis or more conservative. So that's also one of the things that the doctor would like to see. Also the design objective. What is the rate of false positives versus false negatives in the AI predictions? So false positive is basically when uh, when the... Um, let's say in, in the event, in the case of the prostate cancer, if from the data it is the, the, the patient uh, has prostate cancer, but the AI system says, um, sorry, the false positive is when uh, this, the, the patient does not have prostate cancer, but the system predicts that it has. And the false negative is when the patient uh, has prostate cancer, but then the system says that it doesn't have prostate cancer. And finally, the considerations prior to adoption is something that the doctors need to know. For example, if the, the AI system is biased towards any direction, what is the mode of collaboration? So how can the system collaborate with uh, input from the doctor uh, if they want to do a co-diagnosis, if they want to diagnose together? Also, if there is any conflict resolution. So if the AI system uh, leans towards uh, more conservative uh, diagnosis, as we mentioned before, and the doctor is a more liberal towards um, diagnosing cancer severity. So in a nutshell, the main reasons for AI failure in medical apps, why AI systems are still very primitive in being adopted uh, widely in medical applications, uh, if we would like to summarize this, are for the lack of transparency. So the doctors, they don't they they cannot know how an AI, AI system works. It's, it's a black box, as we mentioned. So they want to know the limitations, the capabilities, the intended use, and the utility over existing practices of the AI system. The algorithmic aversion, this means that humans tend to reject the advice of an artificial intelligence system in a case where they would accept the same advice from a human. So that's... Um, something that is quite common, uh, but this is also associated with a lack of transparency. So if the humans, they don't understand how the AI system works, they are more likely to reject it, its advice. 
even though the same advice could come from a human. Interpretability. So machines, that's a bit, that's a big issue because um, it's uh, basically lack of communication from both sides. So machines cannot understand humans and they are often not understandable by humans. So, so there is some sort of misinterpretation uh, between both parts and that creates a lot of problems both in terms of accepting the AI uh, system and also interpreting its outcomes and lack of generalization. So the AI systems are strictly trained for a specific task and if something new comes by, so if we have, for example, a new patient with data that might not be um, that might differ in some way from the trained data that the AI system was trained for, then the result might be completely different, might be a false positive or so on. So a sentence that summarizes uh, this study would be that clinicians are likely to relate to the AI system much like they do to a fellow colleague. So we have to design uh, artificial intelligence systems thinking that they are uh, that they are an equal member of a team, that they, they could behave, they could they should be treated like a fellow colleague. And let's uh, go on uh, with case study two, and this entails CHAT GPT, um, which stands for CHAT Generative Pre-trained uh, Transformer. This is a highly sophisticated AI chatbot. It was developed by a company called OpenAI, which also uh, has a research lab. Um, that gives uh, open access uh, software. It uses natural language processing to create human-like conversational dialogues. It is based on large language model-based processes. So it means that um, it processes vast amounts of text data, mostly from the internet, so from online sources, like articles, social media posts, um, uh, emails, uh, code as well. And it enables users to refine and steer a conversation towards a desired length, format, style. So there are certain parameters that the user can um, uh, enter. And then the, the, the chatbot can produce the relevant content based on the parameters that it's given. And the important part here is that it's self-learning. So it, it continuously improves itself. We don't need a training data set, uh, which is what we do in most cases, uh, mostly with machine learning. Uh, systems. It's self-learning, so it continuously learns from the data that it's it's been given, and it improve it improves itself in terms of accuracy of answers, um, and so on. Some examples that ChatGPT is used for: it can write cover letters for job seekers. Uh, it can summarize documents and blog posts. So we can feed it with a, an online book. And within a few seconds, I would say, it can produce a summary of the book. Um, it, pro it can produce test questions for educators. It can generate legal documents for lawyers based on existing templates, for example, that it retracts from the internet. It also can debug code for software developers. Uh, these are just some screenshots from the examples that I mentioned before. So you can see it, this chat GPT can even generate jokes um, it's uh, highly sophisticated. It can prepare somebody for an interview. So uh, it can give a set of questions that are very spot on based on the targeted uh, job uh, application. It provides a document summary of, of a book within seconds. What are the benefits of chat GPT? Obviously, there are two sides of the story. There are benefits and there are drawbacks. And there is a lot of discussion at the moment around chat GPT. One of the main benefits is obviously that it improves the accuracy and effectiveness of uh, any library search system. Uh, instead of having to search in Google and find liable sources online, uh, it does that within uh, a blink of the eye. Uh, it gives instant access to a wide variety of information, speeding up the scientific research process. So there are a lot of, for example, students that use ChatGPT um, for their research to better understand terminology or find uh, research um, material and other sources. Um, it provides automated reference and information services by answering common questions. And in terms of content creation, obviously it provides an easier and more effective way 
uh, avoiding human mistakes like spelling errors or um, any um, wrong content that might be placed if a human was to write uh, instead, and so on. On the other hand, though, there are implications, obviously, of chat GPT. Uh, there is the issue of, um, sub there are cybersecurity issues um, and many people have uh, raised the concern about uh, the fact that when using chat GPT to learn, uh, to, to do a research or when we feed it with uh, data that are specific to organizations, uh, the software can actually um, generate realistic phishing emails not the software itself, but because it's fed with this data, then this provides um, food for potential uh, for somebody to use this uh, as uh, for phishing emails, for example, that are targeted for the organizations. Um, that it, also another concern is that it uh, kind of hinders creativity because um, use of ChatGPT limits brainstorming for new ideas uh, since it does all the work uh, for, for us. So there is um, a lot of hesitation among media and journalism professionals uh, on using ChatGPT. Another thing is uh, that there is concern that it will replace human resources. Uh, for example, as I mentioned before, ChatGPT has been used for, um, it, it can even debug code. So there is some concern that it could replace software developers because at the moment, at least at the moment, it, uh, it can work um, similar to a junior level coder. There are also ethical issues, obviously. Is the technology using, used in a responsible and transparent manner? What kind, that, does it control the information that is being fed? Uh, and therefore the generated outcome. And there are also legal aspects associated with the use of chat GPT. Who is the owner of the generated material? Is it the software itself? Is it the company that it built the software? Is it the person that uses the software? So the legal framework, um, because all of this research is quite um, recent, that there is no legal framework in place to answer this questions. Legal and ethical framework, I would say. Now let's talk about the future and actually the near future, what is coming uh, upon us. The AI paradox, this is something quite interesting um, because it, uh, it concludes in a sentence something that has troubled a lot AI researchers. So what is difficult, if you think about it, what is difficult for humans, it's easy for the machines. Um, some examples are automating a, a multitude of tasks, memorizing uh, big uh, and very large texts, facts, weighing risk factors, rapidly performing repetitive tasks, limitless predictions, and so on. So this would have been, is actually, it's a fact. It is a difficult task for humans, but it's perhaps the most, the easiest part for a machine. On the other hand, what is easy for the humans is difficult for the machines. And this has to do with understanding human sentiments and emotions, uh, manipulating objects in an uncontrolled environment. So in an environment that the system has not been trained for. Picking up slang language, for example, generalizing tasks. We talk about generalization which is a big problem, a big limitation at the moment for AI systems. So what is difficult for humans is easy for the machines and vice versa. What is easy for the humans is difficult for the machines. So this comes to the conclusion that human and machine intelligence are fundamentally complementary in nature. And we have to treat both aspects having in mind this, um, uh, this sentence. So if we would like to re-envision work uh, how we work with the AI systems because it's a part of our life nowadays and it won't go away. We have to um, to work towards that direction because society uh, is not ready yet to define boundaries and uh, common processes 
work when working with the AI systems. So if we would like to uh, re envision the work, uh, we have to treat humans and AI as equal members of the team. There is a lot of ongoing research on how to improve AI systems, their precision, their accuracy, their bias, so to minimize their bias and so on. But uh, recent research says that this is not the direction, this is not the only direction. We have to move towards considering both humans and AI as a team and then work from there. We have to understand both parts, limitations, capabilities, point of views, functionalities. So we understand what each part is capable of doing, where it's it, it lacks um, capabilities. So the collaborative interaction can be more efficient. And the ultimate gain here is that we achieve a constant and mutual improvement. So where humans uh, fall behind, then there is the AI system that complements and vice versa. And Every part gives feedback to each other for a constant and mutual improvement. This um, concept uh, is taken from a recent paper uh, and they talk about hybrid collective intelligence. The, the paper identifies three types of uh, intelligence. There is the technology centric. So the AI will soon outperform humankind in all areas. So this is one uh, notion. There is the human centric, which uh, supports that humans will always remain superior to AI when it comes to social and societal aspects, both in terms that um, that um, the machine will not be able to understand and to reach the level similar to humans that they understand sentiment, uh, slang language, as we talked previously, emotions, and so on. Uh, but also there is uh, in this part, there is also the other uh, belief that the AI, AI system will be as good as its inventor. And there is also the collective intelligence centric um, approach, notion, I would say, uh, which supports that true intelligence lies in the collective of um, intelligence, in the collective intelligence of both humans and uh, AI systems. But what is actually the take home message from here is somewhere in the middle so that we combined all these three kind of um the three types of intelligence and we talk about hybrid collective intelligence which combines all three aspects so humans and ai machines they work together they collaborate they don't just coexist they don't just cooperate they collaborate they work with each other in the same tasks uh, and they constantly provide feedback to each other uh, so they, they both sides are improved. So if we would like to uh, redesign uh, our relationship uh, with AI systems, we would uh, it would be ideal to base on these three pillar uh, on this, these three pillars. The first one would be that we organize together. so we divide tasks, uh, based on the capabilities and the mode of collaboration and the limitations that each part, each part has. So we can also talk about account accountability in this way. So who is accountable for what tasks? Then uh, we interact together through, human, through a better human-machine communication, uh, through being able to identify intentions and align intentions from both sides identify behaviors and monitor these and uh, evaluate um, behaviors throughout the process. And finally, the third and perhaps most important pillar is the, uh, to be able to improve each other. So through mutual understanding of human and machine limitations and capabilities and a constant interaction, we are able to achieve a constant human AI calibration so this means that both sides are constantly improved and this ultimately increases uh, trust, mostly trust from the human side towards the AI system, which is something that um, is problematic at the moment. So the challenges in redesigning human-machine collaboration would be summarized in these four bullet points. The need for human centricity in designing technologies addressed for humans. So we need to put the human at the center. Um, and design for in favor of the human, but not only uh, having in mind, but not having in mind that the AI system will serve the human. Then we need to develop a more dynamic and flexible human machine team organization. So as I mentioned before, uh, a team where tasks 
can be and activities can be allocated dynamically and flexibly between humans and machine based on each other's strengths and weaknesses. Then we need to capitalize upon machine affordances to help overcome human limitations effectively so we can enhance the human decision making. This means that we capitalize on the strengths of the machine to help humans and we capitalize on the on the strengths of of the humans to improve machines. Finally, develop communication and interface uh, interfaces that can support mutual understanding. A big problem nowadays is the so-called explainability in AI systems. The AI, the AI systems are not transparent and they're not explainable enough. Um, and therefore any interaction with humans is um, has more or less problems. So developing uh, better communication from both sides will increase also the trust in a human machine collaborative configuration. So if we would like to improve human machine partnership, we could summarize that could be a three-step process. So first, um, there is a lot of theoretical background to be researched. So we talk about conducting a thorough research on studying and optimizing collaboration, identifying precise limitations, capabilities, as we mentioned, functionalities, points of view, and so on. Then we have to redefine workforce uh, practices with collaboration in mind. We just don't try, we shouldn't try to incorporate AI systems into existing workflows. So workflows and everyday practices need to be redesigned from the beginning. And then we have, of course, uh, and this is a, a very important part, to prepare for an evolving workforce because AI is now, will be, is currently being and will be woven into collaborative processes. This means that we need to prepare the workforce, um, upskill the workforce, uh, and also increase the acceptance of the workforce so that they are willing and ready to uh, be collaboratively working with AI systems. And finally, this is the last slide that um, it's from a quote from uh, Professor Barbara Gross. She's a computer scientist at Harvard University, and she has published a relevant paper on that. Um, which uh, she said she mentions that AI systems will need to be smart and need to be good teammates. If uh, but this I would say works both ways. Humans need to be good teammates with the AI systems as well. Otherwise, the entire effort will not be successful if we would like to treat them as equal members of a team. So that summarizes uh, my presentation. Thank you for, for your attention. And I will be happy to start the discussion and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, anyone, you can write your questions in the chat or open your mic but until then i want to ask i want to ask you about uh chat gpt as someone who works in uh, machine learning and this technology all these years do you see it as a turning point in the sense that it makes those technologies uh, mainstream because these technologies uh, have been worked on are evolving all these years Doctors use uh, this kind of technologies years now, but ChatGPT, oh, other technologies that you mentioned, like uh, Google Maps and the way or the ads that uh, are targeted, it's not clear for the user. But when a simple citizen uses ChatGPT, he can be impressed immediately because he sees it in action. Mm -hmm. So. Is it a turning point of making uh, AI more mainstream? And also, did ChatGPT help uh, with possibly the funding of similar projects due to its mainstream success? Uh, I think it was definitely an important milestone. Uh, it also took a lot of attention, which also helped um it becoming a milestone uh, from uh, because Elon Musk was also involved in the open AI company and so on um but it definitely uh it definitely comprises a milestone uh, for me I think it all started um 
it all became more apparent to the, the simple user uh, since the digital assistants came by. So the, the moment that Alexa or Siri, they, they, they started to appear, that was the first um, turnover, as you mentioned. But then this is exponentially being uh, evolved at the moment. And chat GPT, I think it will change a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of things the way we perceive AI. Because um, when the digital assistants first appear, I think the society was not that much um, familiarized with the AI and what this is about. Okay, it's impressive that I can talk to a machine and they can understand me. But there were also a lot of bugs, uh, a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, whereas ChatGPT, I think they've done an amazing work there and it's continuously improving and they can give very, very precise uh, and, and to the point answers, which uh, in my mind is what is what impresses the most the user. So I think now, yes, it is a milestone, not not the turnover as you as as you uh, mentioned, uh, at least uh, in my opinion. But it's a very important milestone, and now from now on, I think we will we're going to see exponential uh, evolvement towards uh, in highly sophisticated chatbots and uh, assistants as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, since you are uh, more than uh, well acquainted with academia, and also you are uh, in editorial boards of journals. Considering chat GPT in higher education and in research, in academia in general, what's your perspective? How can you see it uh, working well or creating problems? You talked about uh, students using it to, to help them with... Um, their papers or assignments or whatever. How can we find the balance between helping for the assignment and being productive or just, you know, taking something, copying it, possibly mistakes that the student will take for granted, or even researchers at a higher level using ChatGPT extensively for research papers? How do you see ChatGPT in academia? That's the. That's I think uh, I think as with every tool, um, first of all, it's as good as the user uh, is, and the, the use can be what we make out of it. So I would say that um, ChatGPT, if used uh, in a correct way, it can be a very very powerful tool. Although I'm not sure if, for example, all these resources that it um, it presents are liable, are checked for liability, that, that I'm not sure enough. Whereas traditional uh, sources like Google um, Google Scholar, for example, for publications and uh, uh, for academic publications, we know that uh, it's already checked for that all these are liable sources, uh, well checked. Um, this is one thing that I'm not sure about. If all the sources that is that uses are liable, so I'm not sure if a user can completely rely on that. Um, to be honest, it's something uh, new. There should be a, a legal framework around that that restricts certain sorts of usage, if I may so. Um, but it's still all very new and boundaries are very fuzzy so i would say that at this moment at least with current circumstances the, the tool can be um used it's like a knife you, you can kill someone or you can use it to cut your food um but i think that's a very good example of how i see chat gpt at the moment um as a member of as a reviewer and member of the editorial board have you seen or have you um, heard about other other instances of overuse of chat GPT that's visible in papers, etc.? Is it something that 
happening extensively. Uh, as a uh, as a, a member of the editorial board uh, and the peer reviewer, no, I haven't I haven't heard any of that. But um, through my involvement in uh, in this uh, European funded research projects, uh, I've known cases, I've heard cases, and that, that was actually one topic of discussion in a recent uh, meeting I had with some partners, that the generation of deliverables, uh, the deliverable, it, it's the official document that summarizes work within a project and is submitted to the European Union for, um, for official review. Uh, I have heard that, uh, in some organizations, they have used ChatGPT to generate a deliverable for that. I haven't seen it to see how, um, if it's plausible enough or not. But that was a big, um, a big issue of discussion, uh, because then there are other implications like. Um, I don't know, possible leakage or if, if the deliverable, for example, is confidential, then there are concerns about uh, leakage of information from the organization, as I, as I also mentioned before. So there are other implications uh, that are coming into that are coming in in that occasion. But I have heard for a deliverable in okay. a European project. Uh, let me read uh, a comment in the chat a question. AI can help us promote health and health quality. However, addiction to technology is a major thing that I am intrigued whether we can protect ourselves from addiction. Where should we should be the limit and when is it appropriate to use AI at what age? That's a good question actually. Um I always say that it's uh, for the new generation it's uh, quite good to familiarize at an early stage with technology, but everything has its limits. So it's it's not for me to say that, okay, you have to be exposed one hour per day on, uh, on your digital assistant or whatever, but uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, balance is, um, is very important. And I can give you an example, a recent example that I read about in Sweden. So in Sweden, um, the last 10 years, they have uh, actually uh, got rid of all the traditional methods, uh, you know, books and so on in education. And they have uh, introduced tablets uh, from, from kindergarten school. And then after 10 years, they conducted recently a study um, and they realized that, uh, that students that were... 10, not 10, 12, 13 years old now that they started um, when all this uh, system was uh, applied, they had problems. They had problems in writing. They had problems in concentrating. So then they decided to go back to a balance, a balanced system between technology and uh, traditional methods. And, and I think the, the reason why I mentioned that is because it's a very good lesson uh, to learn that I think a balance is absolutely important here. So who is to impose that balance? I can't answer that question because it's a multi-parametric um, thing. It's, I don't know, the family, the state, the education system. Um, it's a lot of things. But I'm very much in favor of a balance. Yeah, I agree and that both in school and in universities that we work on. Yes, absolutely. They, they, the students should be trained to use AI. I mean, even in universities, there should be, I don't know, a course or whatever, seminars, etc., that will show them some things. Absolutely. And since I would say since primary school, they have to to through, you know, play, playful interactions, they have to get acquainted uh, with what is AI because it's in everyday's life. It's in everyday's activities. So they have to be acquainted. But the balance is a is a very big discussion that yeah. uh, I don't think there are precise answers in that. OK. Um... Another question more, uh, more philosophical, uh, because, for example, I was watching an interview of Christopher Nolan, the director of Oppenheimer, and he talked about those moments that they were, they knew 
they didn't know if they should push the button for the atomic bomb because they they couldn't be sure for the consequences. And he mentioned about the AI thing that maybe scientists, there will be a scientist somewhere that will have to make a tough decision about some AI. That's like a borderline science fiction philosophical question, but could you see a point where we should be really afraid of a technology that emerges from AI evolution? This actually, this reminds me of something that uh, I read uh, a year ago that Facebook have, uh, has developed two, uh, two AI systems that were talking to each other. And then suddenly uh, they were self-learning algorithms and suddenly they they changed to another language that they built themselves and they, they, they were the only ones that could understand. And then Facebook had to shut down... Um, they had to shut down because it it started becoming a little bit frightening. So um, it actually happened. I mean, it, in on a research basis because that was the research lab of Facebook. Uh, but it it is there. It is a possibility. Uh, and and this is why it, it all has to be accompanied accompanied with the proper framework, uh, the proper framework, legal, ethical, educational framework. Uh, the society has to be ready for that. Um, so it is it is something, it is a big worry when it comes to all this AI research fuss. Yeah, because the, when the potential is seemingly unlimited, yeah, the risks are there too, I guess. Yes, everything has its uh, risks and, uh, and benefits, but we have to... Uh, we have to decide what overcomes what uh, in order to keep using a technology. I think the benefits of using AI are more than the risks. And with the proper frameworks in place, uh, we can manage to have uh, the right, well, close to the right, because we can never be 100% sure that they have been, they are used in the right way. But we can work towards that direction. Okay, great. Uh, is there any other question uh, from the chat? Anything you want to ask? Or you can open your mic. Uh, hi, it's Electra. Hi, uh, I just wanted to say something uh, in regards to your previous comment, Alkinos, uh, because I, I believe you mentioned something about uh, the project development if, um, since um, we are in that... Uh, we're developing some proposals to, to receive funding from the EU. Uh, so um, I was also intrigued in some, um, uh, let's say, more simple uh, proposals uh, to ask GPT to provide me with some um, uh, replies uh, in some more general questions. So, for example, uh, how do you believe uh, that you will manage, I don't know, the proposal, etc.? Uh, so this is something general, and um, I, I believe that ChatGPT can give you like a, a concrete answer of the methodology of how a general uh, management of a proposal is done. So um, uh, for me, it was very helpful uh, because uh, it provided me with the, the method, but then I had to um, uh, tailor uh, the response um, well in my uh, proposal. So as uh, Tatiana mentioned before, uh, this uh, tool is a very supportive tool. It can uh, provide you with some answers that um, uh, could make your life easier when uh, writing something. But definitely, um, I, I don't know, at least in my case, uh, it needed further um uh, I had to review it well, uh, so to to fit uh, in my proposal. Uh, and in addition, because uh, I have uh, worked with other researchers, um, when uh, some one um, I I feel that ChatGPT provides the responses in a specific manner. Uh, if you ask something, it usually gives you the, the bullet points. It's it says something general about. Uh, if you ask, for example, something about community engagement, it says uh, that uh, for community engagement you can do the following: a blah blah blah, b blah blah blah. 
so if um, a researcher takes that and copy paste it in a document, uh, it's very easy to, to understand that this um, text was not produced by uh, like a person, if I can say so. So I really believe that it's something helpful and can support what we as a researcher or, or I don't know, um, uh, proposal developers uh, we do, but uh, um, it definitely needs uh, like the human mind in a way uh, to, to, to make it um, more tailor made yeah, to the needs of uh, what you're writing, either it's an article or a research paper or a proposal. It's what uh, Tatiana said uh, for AI in general, it is complementary exactly. to the exactly. You know, and uh, that's the line that because we have young people, young students in here, uh, I want them to understand that because I have seen papers in assignments, etc., that it's pretty obvious that part is just chat GPT, nothing. You you can see it, and it needs the human uh, the human improvements and to, to make it specific to what we are working on. Let me let me read the question here. AI has gained much recognition and research funding might be directed towards AI. Is that a barrier for researchers that want to study something else other than AI? Example, they are trying to find the funding, a PhD funding. Is AI a trending theme that would lose its interest in some years or should researchers direct their study over AI? Shall I answer that? Uh, I can yeah. tell you because, again, um, we often uh, write proposals for further funding for our research projects. So I can see the trends that are coming from the European Union, which, of course, reflect the trends uh, globally. Uh, there is a lot of heavy, heavy funding towards research on AI. But um, the important thing is that Obviously, they are funding also other aspects, okay, data analytics, cybersecurity, climate, and so on. Uh, the the um, promising thing is that they don't just fund pure technology, like developments in AI and so on. They, they fund um, a wider framework where they want to involve uh, scientists from social sciences and humanities because they, they, the the trend is not only to develop a more accurate and more precise uh, AI system, but also to create this framework that I previously talked about. So it's not uh, limiting. It's not like the only way. It's not. It's a trend. Yes, it is a trend. Um, but if you think that we are going through a, a digital, uh, we are in the digital society of tomorrow, um, it is a very hot topic. It will be useful, but it's a good sign that um, funding programs like the European Unions and other programs, they want to see a more holistic approach. So they fund uh, other kind of in interdisciplinary research around AI. Yeah. And Electra just uh, messaged the chat that uh, lately there's a great interest in legal aspects, for example, in relations yeah. to AI. That's mm -hmm. true. I mean, uh, the, the, the legal frameworks that uh, will need to be to be created, etc. Yeah, there's a whole uh, th there's a whole uh, research uh, there for lawyers and uh, persons in the legal area. Yeah, definitely, it creates. This funding, I believe, it creates all uh, the other um, objectives in other sciences that may come close to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay. Uh, we are about in the one hour mark. Um, if there are no other questions, we can end uh, this dialogue here. Uh, thank you very much, Tatiana. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. The discussion was really interesting and the, the questions. Yeah. Uh, so, everyone, uh, see you in the next uh, dialogue.
Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Thank Goodbye. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.